Oh hey, you know, Capcom's Devil May Cry series sure knows how to have a good time. With its emphasis on stylish action and an air of braggadocious charm, it's become an endearing cornerstone in Capcom's iconic library of games. Over the course of its 18-year history, the series reveling in hyper-stylized and complex combat would set a new standard for action games upon its first release, inspiring other developers to step up in turn and pushing Capcom to evolve further. With the upcoming release of Devil May Cry 5, we're taking a look back at the series, detailing its unexpected beginnings, and recounting how it became the exuberant, crazy, and immensely satisfying action franchise it is today. This is the history of Devil May Cry. Devil May Cry. Capcom's Devil May Cry series is a name that's synonymous with fast hack-and-slash gameplay that marches to the beat of its own drum. However, the series that would be Devil May Cry originally began its life as something quite different. Following the massive success of Resident Evil 2 in 1998, which pushed Capcom to fast-track work on Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, series creator Shinji Mikami drafted plans for the next major game in the survival horror franchise. Resident Evil 2 director Hideki Kamiya was tapped to helm the new project, bringing the series to the PlayStation 2. Internally, Kamiya made a name for himself through his passionate and uncompromising approach to game design, often emphasizing challenging gameplay. With his experience and punk personality, producers were confident he'd bring a fresh change to the series. While details are scarce, Kamiya's project was the earliest incarnation of Resident Evil 4, and featured a new protagonist named Tony, who possessed supernatural powers similar to series antagonist Albert Wesker. Although still a horror game, there was also a greater emphasis placed on action-oriented gameplay. This prompted the shift away from the series' 2D pre-rendered backgrounds to a new perspective using a dynamic camera system for 3D space. After an extended time in production, Shinji Mikami and other members of Capcom felt that the game had strayed too far from Resident Evil's roots. But instead of scrapping the work altogether, they made the decision to rework it into a new IP. No longer tied to the Resident Evil name, the developers, rebranding themselves internally as Team Little Devils, leaned further into the action horror angle. In an interview with Electronic Gaming Monthly, Kamiya stated that he did some internal playtesting on Onimusha Warlords, another game with roots in Resident Evil, while laying the groundwork for his game. During his playthrough, he noticed a strange bug that allowed him to juggle enemies with the character's attacks. This greatly amused the director, and he incorporated it into the new game's mechanics. Instead of Resident Evil's familiar monsters, the new game would feature demons of all shapes and sizes, some of whom towered over the main character. The style of combat also took some cues from classic Hong Kong martial arts films, particularly in how to stage an action scene. Kamiya took particular inspiration for the characterization of Dante from the classic anime manga series Space Adventure Cobra, which starred a swashbuckling interstellar adventurer possessing a Devil May Care attitude. To pay homage to Dante Alighieri's timeless poem, The Divine Comedy, which saw its protagonist travel through the many realms of hell, the lead character Tony was renamed Dante. With a brand new style and framework set, they eventually dubbed their new approach to gameplay as Stylish Action, a heavy freeform and open-ended take on combat. Because it was one of Capcom's early PS2 titles, the publisher put a lot of effort into the game's marketing, which included some humorous takes on Dante's style of combat. With considerable hype surrounding the game following E3 2001, the new IP would go on to make a sizable impression on first-time players. Devil May Cry would release on August 23rd, 2001 in Japan for the PS2, with the US and PAL regions coming shortly after. As the half-demon, half-human son of the legendary Dark Knight Sparta, the devil-hunting bounty hunter Dante takes on numerous jobs battling monsters and otherworldly foes. 
Devil may cry. Oh, sorry, we closed at nine. Again, no password. I can't seem to get any real business. While in between gigs at his headquarters named, well, Devil May Cry, a mysterious femme fatale named Trish seeks the son of Sparta for a dangerous job. What follows is an incredibly over-the-top exposition scene loaded to the brim with crazy action, perfectly setting the tone for what's to come. Time to go to work, guys. Over the course of the game, Dante faces off against hordes of demons controlled by the Prince of Darkness, Mundus. Players will gradually uncover more details about Dante's past, while also seeing the true extent of his demonic abilities. The Devil Hunter also squares off with the Hell Knight known as Nello Angelo, who proves to be a formidable match for Dante. Starting out with his twin handguns, Ebony and Ivory, and with his father's sword, Force Edge, Dante expands his arsenal of weapons to include a sawed-off shotgun and several Devil Arms, weapons of demonic origin. In addition to the Ifrit Frame Gauntlet, he'll acquire the Lightning Sword Alistair, first introduced in one of the game's more gruesome scenes. Though mechanically it's far removed from Resident Evil, some echoes of that series' formula remains. Backtracking and light puzzle-solving were present, prompting players to make some extended treks to unlock new areas of the castle. While it still invokes an eerie, dread-inducing atmosphere similar to its distant cousin, Devil May Cry's rock-and-roll approach to horror presented a pulsating contrast to the foreboding tone. Running at a solid 60 frames per second, this would be the standard for most of the series, which allowed players to stay in tune with the pacing at all times. By locking onto enemies, Dante could trade off in between long-range and melee attacks with ease, allowing him to pull off slick maneuvers, such as launching foes in the air and blowing them apart with a close-range shotgun blast. This was the core aspect of the stylish action that the creators were going for. Instead of playing it safe and reacting to enemies, Devil May Cry expected players to act aggressively and to switch up their tactics when the situation called for it. In doing so, players could engage with the free-form flow of combat, dynamically coming up with their own styles of play. Moreover, all moves performed in combat were graded. Getting hit or repeating the same moves would lower this style ranking. But if you kept a steady flow going and switched up moves on the regular, you would obtain the ever-elusive Stylish rank and earn extra orbs, which could be used to upgrade Dante's abilities. Though the early missions actively empowered players by throwing common foes their way, the show-stopping boss fights proved to be battles too tough for many. The first encounter with Phantom, a lava-spewing scorpion-slash-spider hybrid demon, because eh, why not, proved to be a major hurdle for players. This fight would set the ground rules for all boss fights going forward, including the final confrontation with Mundus at the game's end. Are you the human? The son of Sparta who challenges the darkness, Mundus? Block off, Featherface, or you can stick around and find out the hard way. While Devil May Cry can be hammy throughout, even during some intense encounters, there are some key moments where the story steps into dramatic territory, leading to some touching, if mostly melodramatic moments. I should have been the one to fill your dark soul with light! After completing Devil May Cry, the harder difficulty settings unlock. In the mode, aptly named Dante Must Die, all enemies have access to the Devil Trigger mechanic, greatly boosting their strength. And after that, the legendary Dark Knight mode is unlocked, letting players swap Dante out for his father, Sparta, who presents himself in a far more regal manner. Upon its release, Devil May Cry would receive strong praise from fans and press alike. In GameSpot's review, the game was lauded for its fast-paced and challenging gameplay, proving itself to be a must-have for PlayStation owners. The game immediately had strong sales, and quickly found its way onto the PlayStation 2's list of greatest hits. DMC1 was especially a hit for hardcore players. Fans online began to share tips and videos of their best performances, akin to the community surrounding fighting games like Street Fighter. 
Since this was before the launch of YouTube and other dedicated video sites, the actual sharing of these videos mostly took place on online messaging forums and custom sites like GeoCities, giving the hardcore DMC fanbase an underground mystique. Around the time of Devil May Cry 1's release in 2001, the producers at Capcom could sense they had a hit on their hands with the new IP. Not wanting to waste an opportunity, they immediately began work on Devil May Cry 2 with an entirely different team. The original team would learn of the sequel's existence after the fact, which created some friction internally. This would eventually be the spark for Kamiya and Team Little Devils to form something new, but more on that later. With an expected release in early 2003, little more than a year after the launch of the original, the DMC2 team was under a lot of pressure. According to series creator Hideki Kamiya, who was very candid about his past experiences with Capcom, the sequel was in crisis. With only five months before launch, producers replaced the original director of DMC2 with veteran developer Hideaki Itsuno, whose past work included fighting games such as the Street Fighter Alpha series and Rival Schools. With the release window firm, the new director had to shepherd the game to the finish. Devil May Cry 2 would hit its launch date on January 23, 2003 for the PlayStation 2 in the US, with the Japan and PAL versions arriving soon after. In Devil May Cry 2, players would once again control Dante set several years after the original. Now older and a bit more reserved than in the original game, he comes into conflict with Arius, the president of the corporation Ouroboros. Seeking four demonic artifacts to grant himself immense power, the villain planned to summon forth a powerful demon in order to take over the world. I will become an all-powerful immortal! <laughs> DMC2 included a second protagonist in the form of Luca, another femme fatale with demonic powers of her own. The sequel also featured two distinct campaigns for both characters on their own separate discs. Though DMC2 had a great deal of hype surrounding its release, the final product would receive heavy criticism for regression from the original. One particular point of contention was Dante's personality, with the Devil Hunter only occasionally dropping one-liners, which felt very out of character. Looks like it's your lucky day. Wonderful. I am very pleased. Over the course of Devil May Cry 2's parallel stories, Dante would learn more about Sparta's lasting influence, and Luca would come to understand the truth about her past. Just like in the original game, the protagonist would gradually uncover new weapons and confront several bosses of varying sizes. While both Dante and Luca's stories would each cover the same ground, both characters had special encounters unique to their campaigns. Going for a more streamlined and scaled-down approach, DMC2's combat made a number of changes. The playable characters possessed all their unique combat abilities from the beginning, and upgrading weapons only slightly increased attack strength. The game did introduce a new amulet system, which tried to fill in that gap for customizing playstyles, which amplified Dante and Luca's Devil Trigger states with enhanced abilities. Movement and attacks were also overhauled for easier access to key moves, and an increased focus on verticality and agility. The protagonist could wall run and shoot upside down in midair at the enemies below, and even swap weapons mid-combo, allowing for some extra finesse during fights. However, the sequel removed many of the original's more iconic attacks, such as the Million Stab. In response to player surveys taken after the first game's release, the sequel's difficulty was significantly dialed down. This was intended to let players pick up the game without frustration, but the end result was a game that made combat encounters far too easy, letting players rinse and repeat attacks without much worry from the enemies or the overly forgiving style rankings. Though Devil May Cry 2 featured questionable design choices, it still possessed some welcome innovations. In addition to a mission select and weapon swapping, a new mode called Bloody Palace would open up, letting players fight waves of enemies through a lengthy dungeon. These features would eventually go on to become the game's more worthwhile contributions to the series. Though Devil May Cry 2 was a popular seller, it fared poorly when it came to critics and general audience reaction. GameSpot scored the game a 6.4 and stated in its review that the downgraded gameplay and presentation made it a disappointing sequel, 
DMC2 is generally seen as the black sheep of the series. The developers don't view the game very favorably either, with the sequels that came after largely ignoring it. Despite the series' poor reputation, the series itself would still remain popular after DMC2's release. Dante even found his way into non-video game media, including a North American comic series and a 2003 manga which dealt with the events before the first game. After DMC1, and with the sequel underway without them, creator Hideki Kamiya and Team Little Devils collectively began work on a new IP that took some inspiration from their past work. They channeled that energy into something that took a far more stylized and cinematic approach. But we'll save that for its own episode. Maybe. Kamiya and the other creatives would use Beautiful Joe as a launchpad to form a new dev team within Capcom known as Clover Studio. Although only active for four years, they released well-beloved titles such as God Hand and Okami, all of which were informed by their work on Devil May Cry. The first official release under the Clover name would be the PS2 port of Beautiful Joe. Although largely the same game, the version included DMC1's Dante as an unlockable character. Dante and Trish would replace the two leads, prompting the bounty hunter to fight his way through the movie world using his unique skill set. In one of Dante's most unique appearances, he found his way into the 2004 release of Atlas's JRPG Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. This collaboration happened as a suggestion from one of the developers, who was a fan of Devil May Cry. Set in the post-apocalyptic ruins of demon-infested Shinjuku, Japan, the Devil Hunter actively tailed the game's lead character during the journey. As the first SMT game released in the West, Atlas wanted to create some additional buzz for the game's launch, which they also made very, very, very clear on the game's box art. Since DMC's debut, there was a notable resurgence in action games from other developers, many of whom cited the series as a big influence. The creators of God of War regularly mentioned Devil May Cry as an inspiration for the game's combat. Although DMC2 wasn't the sequel that publisher Capcom hoped for, it ultimately paved the way for the series' return to form. Revealed at E3 2004, Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening was the next game in the series. As a prequel, it focused on Dante's younger, more rebellious years, while also revealing his past feud with his twin brother Virgil. In the original Devil May Cry, it was revealed that the boss Nello Angelo was actually Virgil, whom had been corrupted by Mundus. Hideaki Itsuno would return to direct Dante's Awakening. In the lead-up to the release, he stated that he wanted to do the series proper justice, while also expanding upon the story and sense of style. During a Devil May Cry panel at PAX West 2018, Itsuno would refer to the particular style he brought to the series as Chunin, evoking the same exuberance and sense of fun that's commonly associated with anime and action films. A stronger focus on story allowed the team to also dial up the excess and bravado from the original game. So, the developers sought performers that could bring physicality and charisma to their roles. Casting both Ruben Langdon and Daniel Southworth for Dante and Virgil respectively, they provided voiceovers and motion capture for the game's cutscenes. This approach would go on to set a new standard for Capcom's AAA games, significantly improving the quality of presentation for their games moving forward. Released on February 17, 2005 in Japan, with the US launch on March 22, 2005, Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening would prove to be the rebirth that the series needed. I met the sons of Sparta, both of them. Though the same blood of their father flowed through their veins, the two battled each other fiercely like arch enemies. It seemed as if they derived some sort of twisted pleasure from this brotherly fighting. Sorry, not open for business yet. Mirroring the opening of the original game, the up-and-coming devil hunter Dante is visited by the Egmatic Arkham, a human with a keen interest in demons and the legend of Sparta. Arkham also reveals that he is working with Dante's brother Virgil, and the demons soon begin to take over the city. After fighting off monsters who've broken into his office, a massive tower forms in the center of the city. No doubt you've got some fun planned for me, right Virgil? 
Dante sets out to find his brother and eventually encounters other powerful demons and another human referred to as Lady, who is seeking revenge against her father Arkham. <laughs> Here I am trying to help you, and you show your thanks by shooting me? Eventually the twins would face off to decide who is the rightful heir to Sparta's legacy. Oh, this is what they call a heartwarming family reunion, eh? You got that right. In DMC3, Dante is given more dramatic presence to counterbalance his familiar wisecracking antics. A heightened sense of style would also show off with the game's new suite of weapons, including the talking twin swords and the incredibly bizarre yet strangely appropriate lightning guitar slash scythe hybrid. With an expanded arsenal, Dante could customize his loadouts with the various upgrade statues throughout the game. Switching weapons returned from DMC2, now working for both ranged and melee combat. Holding up to two melee weapons and two firearms, players could deck out Dante in any way they saw fit, letting Dante swap tactics and skills mid-combo while maintaining a stylish flow. After your first confrontation with Virgil, Dante, as the subtitle clearly states, will awaken to his inner Devil Trigger ability. Depending on which weapon he wields while in his Devil Trigger state, Dante's appearance will alter to fit the style of the melee weapon. Both Dante and Virgil's Devil Triggers were designed by Atlas designer Kazuma Kaneko, who Capcom collaborated on with Nocturne. Venturing slightly into RPG territory, DMC3 introduced a new mechanic known as the Style System. Players could select from six different combat styles, which focused on different facets of Dante's skills. The Swordmaster, more on melee combat abilities, the Trickster on dodges and teleports, Gunslinger opened up new firearm skills, Royal Guard allowed Dante to parry attacks, Quicksilver gave the Devil Hunter the ability to stop time, and Doppelganger let Dante create a shadow clone of himself. Using one style for extended periods leveled it up, increasing the style's effectiveness. In order to satisfy hardcore players of the series in the West, Capcom made the somewhat misguided decision to calibrate the difficulties between different releases. With the original DMC3, the hard mode version for the Japanese version was made the normal version for the Western release. This unfortunately ended up alienating many players who struggled with the game's challenge. Within each of us flows his blood, but more importantly, his soul! And now, my soul is saying it wants to stop you! <laughs> Unfortunately, our souls are at odds, brother. I need more power. Devil May Cry 3 Dante's Awakening would release two strong reviews from critics. Although the initial sales faltered when compared to the previous games, many fans saw it as a return to form. In GameSpot's review, the expanded combat was praised, however the difficulty was criticized for being unfair. Devil May Cry 3 would become the first game in the series to see an updated release, with Devil May Cry 3 Special Edition. Releasing as a PS2 Greatest Hits title in the West, this version of the game rebalanced the difficulty settings, added new boss encounters with the puckish Jester, and reintroduced DMC2's Bloody Palace. Furthermore, a new Turbo Mode was also introduced, doubling the game's speed. However, the Special Edition's most exciting feature was the playable Virgil. Though he goes through the exact same levels as Dante, and strangely enough battles his doppelganger during the Virgil boss fights, new cutscenes were added to show more of his side to the story. After Devil May Cry 3's release, the series would eventually receive an anime series of its own, with Ruben Langdon reprising his role as Dante. Coming from Madhouse, the same studio behind Death Note, Gungrave, and Trigun, this series was set after the events of DMC1, focusing on Dante and close allies taking on various missions, dealing with demons and the occult in incredibly over-the-top fashion. But with the new generation of consoles approaching, Capcom made plans to ensure that their series would be ready to make the jump. At E3 2005, only a few months after DMC3's launch, Devil May Cry 4 was announced as a PlayStation 3 exclusive. With the Xbox 360 also set to release later that year, Capcom would capitalize on the new platform by developing a new slate of IPs geared toward a Western audience. These titles were Dead Rising and Lost Planet, both of which utilized Capcom's next-gen engine, MT Framework. 
The series producers also saw an opportunity to expand DMC even further. In 2007, just a year before its launch, it was announced that DMC4 would release simultaneously for the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. This decision was made as a result of the success the developers had with the 360, and also due to the rising challenges associated with the PS3's cell processor infrastructure. The news of the series going multi-platform was met with heavy criticism from longtime fans, who weren't comfortable with a series once dedicated to the PlayStation platform releasing elsewhere. Hideaki Itsuno would once again direct the next Devil May Cry game. Though Dante would return for the new entry, the developers also wanted to switch things up. This came in the form of a new protagonist possessing a different playstyle, giving newcomers a solid entry point for the series. Nero's demonic Devilbringer allowed him to grapple enemies up close. Also, his sword, known as the Red Queen, just so happened to have a motorcycle handle on it, which can be revved up to power his attacks. Portrayed by Johnny Young Bosch, who played Vosh the Stampede in Trigun, Ichigo in Bleach, and was also a former Power Ranger, Nero brought a particular swagger and youthful exuberance that made him an interesting contrast to Dante. In the years since his launch, the developers have stated that work on the game was a challenging process due to rapid changes in technology. Narrative writer Bingo Morihashi stated in an interview in the Devil May Cry 3142 graphics art book that, due to poor communication and limited manpower, many ideas couldn't make the cut. Several of these concepts often related to Nero, who actually had other demonic forms at one point. On January 31st, 2008, Devil May Cry 4 would launch on the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360, marking the series' first release on new consoles. Devil May Cry. In Devil May Cry 4, you start the game as Nero, a soldier in the Order of the Sword on the island of Fortuna. During a sermon held by the High Priest Sanctus, Dante attacks members of the Holy Order, and Nero faces off with the Devil Hunter. So, you're looking to play, huh? Alright, I guess I got some time to kill. After coming to an uneasy truce, Dante reveals that demons are among them, prompting Nero to find his own answers throughout Fortuna. Eventually, his latent demonic powers come to light, revealing abilities that prove to be a match for even Dante. But once things escalate out of control, the veteran Devil Hunter takes the reins to clean up the mess that's overtaken the island. I'll sweep the city and evacuate the people. Hey, is this your way of ditching and dumping this you mess up? You wanna switch? It's cool. Let's stick to the plan. Though Nero's playstyle was far more limited when compared to the versatility of Dante, players could still get a lot of mileage out of his Devilbringer skills and his melee attacks. Eventually, Nero would gain access to his own Devil Trigger after acquiring Virgil's weapon from DMC3. When activated, Nero conjures forth a specter in the form of Virgil's Devil Trigger, greatly amplifying the strength and range of his attacks. Though it's never stated outright, DMC4 presents strong hints that Nero himself may have some relation to the Sparta bloodline. Power. Give me more. Power. During the midpoint of the game, Dante once again takes center stage. Just like his outing in DMC3, he utilizes the multi-style system in combat. But in DMC4, Dante can swap styles in real time, in addition to utilizing all of his weapons without having to choose a loadout. Though Dante's suite of weapons are mostly familiar, one new devil arm is the Lucifer. Utilizing a fighting style similar to a flamingo dance, the Lucifer fires out demonic shards that explodes on command. The weapon is first introduced in a innuendo-laced monologue that gets extremely tongue-in-cheek very quickly. In the end, we're all satisfied. Though Dante's section featured some of the game's biggest moments, his half of the game was heavily criticized for excessive padding, which many fans and critics were disappointed by. This feeling of padding was epitomized in the appearance of a strange dice game that slowed the pace down considerably. Yeah. 
DMC4 also added some new gameplay moments outside of combat, which included new set-piece encounters similar to moments in games like God of War. In the game's most standout encounter, Dante battles a towering demonic statue in the form of Sparta, requiring the Devil Hunter to leap across multiple platforms to find its various weak points. In traditional fashion, completing the game would unlock the Bloody Palace mode, and access to the additional difficulty modes, including Dante Must Die. Two additional modes were also added in the form of Heaven and Hell and Hell and Hell modes. The former, returning from DMC3, was the hardest mode but with all the enemies dying in one hit, while the latter would result in the protagonist dying in one hit. Devil May Cry 4 would go on to receive solid reviews from the press and fans alike. In GameSpot's review, it was praised for its impressive combat, but received heavy criticism for the repetitive structure. Thanks to the multi-platform launch, DMC4 would eventually become the best-selling game in the series, which still stands to this day. Hardcore fans of the series took a strong liking to the game as well, with many stating that the gameplay of DMC4 has the most sophisticated combat in the series. The game would also make its way to the PC, which delivered increased performance and a new mode which significantly increased the amount of enemies on screen. In the late 2000s and early 2010s, Capcom began to undergo some changes as a result to the shifting landscape of the gaming market. Following the release of DMC4, many of the game's key staff felt fatigued and wanted to move on to different projects. Director Hideaki Itsuno would go on to helm Dragon's Dogma, Capcom's ambitious attempt at an open-world RPG. Some key creatives who worked on the DMC series left Capcom to form the new studio Platinum Games. Their first game for the PS3 and Xbox 360 would be the action-adventure Hack-and-Slash Bayonetta, which was helmed by DMC1 director Hideki Kamiya. Platinum Games would go on to make more games in a similar vein, including Metal Gear Rising Revengeance and Nier Automata. The original DMC trilogy would also see a return with the 2012 release of the Devil May Cry HD Collection for the PS3 and 360. In 2018, the collection would eventually be ported to the PC, PS4, and Xbox One. Still proving to be a popular character, Dante made an appearance in Project X Zone, a turn-based strategy game mashing together characters from Sega, Capcom, and Bandai Namco libraries. However, his most recognizable guest spot ever would be in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Fate of Two Worlds. Dante and Trish joined the roster of characters, and they took part in the 3v3 battles that utilized the game's tag team systems. In the enhanced version, Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, Virgil was also added to the roster. Despite all these cameos, Capcom had no immediate plans for a sequel to DMC4. Capcom's former head of global production, Keiji Inafune, would push for more collaborations with Western developers. Along with new IPs such as Dark Void, producers even gave Western studios a shot at their existing franchises, including Dead Rising, Bionic Commando, and even Resident Evil. The fans were clamoring for a new Devil May Cry, however, the next game bearing that particular name wasn't quite the game they were expecting. Revealed at Tokyo Game Show 2010, DMC Devil May Cry, yes that is with a lowercase m, was a reimagining of the series mythos. Developed by Ninja Theory, previously of Heavenly Sword and enslaved Odyssey to the West fame, at the initial reveal Ninja Theory and Capcom presented the game as their most ambitious collaborative effort yet. Capcom approached Ninja Theory because of their experience with action games that have a strong focus on narrative and presentation. Unfortunately, the sudden reveal of a reboot for Devil May Cry was met with controversy, leading to an incredibly toxic period for the developers and community alike. One of the more vocal points of the backlash was the focus on the new character's design, particularly the lack of Dante's familiar white hair. Throughout development, the Dante of DMC actually went through a number of changes. In addition to some designs that resembled Geralt from The Witcher, to a quasi-Jason Statham look, they also made concepts that were fairly close to the classic Dante. However, Capcom and Itsuno himself stressed to the developers at Ninja Theory that they should make DMC the way they wanted to. So in turn, they created a design that echoes that of the previous incarnations, while also standing out on its own. 
To add more weight to its new narrative, Ninja Theory consulted with 28 Days Later and Sunshine screenwriter Alex Garland, who they had previously worked with on Enslaved Odyssey to the West. In the years since the game's reveal, several members of the dev team stated that DMC was revealed too early and on the wrong foot, which only added to the negativity from fans eager for more information. Many of the more intense criticisms from fans were levied against the developers themselves, often citing the studio's average track record on previous games. Fans also became upset after learning that the game would run at 30 frames per second on consoles, a noticeable step down from previous games. Unfortunately, the negativity would later escalate into online threats and harassment against the developers. More than two years after its reveal, Ninja Theory's DMC Devil May Cry would eventually release worldwide on January 15, 2003 for the PS3 and Xbox 360, with the PC version on January 25th. Get your filthy fucking claw off my trailer. The reboot starts off with Dante, now a half-angel, half-demon, being known as a Nephilim, enjoying a night out on the town. Not long after, he's discovered by a powerful demon known as the Hunter, who seeks out the living descendants of Sparta. Dante soon reunites with his long-lost brother Virgil, and they work together with their human ally Cat and a secret organization to overcome the influence of the demon king Mundus. DMC's plot takes large influences from films like John Carpenter's They Live, presenting a story about two parallel worlds in hidden conflict, but with a more youthful energy throughout. It'll kill you. Draw attention. Dante. In DMC, Dante is depicted as far more rebellious than previous games, and Mundus is presented as a demonic corporate overlord who's weaponized late-stage capitalism to enslave humanity. How do people actually fall for this crap? Though Ninja Theory's DMC has a darker and more satirical plot than the previous games, it uses realistic topics like debt and propaganda as a backdrop for its action-oriented focus on hacking and slashing demons. There's still plenty of moments of humor, some of which break the fourth wall and poke fun at the controversy surrounding the game. Not a million years. The combat of DMC takes a more flexible approach from past games, while still referencing some of classic Dante's iconic skills. Utilizing three weapon styles, the human, demon, and angel forms each have their own moves and unique weapons tied to them. Swapping between forms alters Dante's fighting style dramatically, leading to some impressive combos that play into Dante's aerial abilities and raw attack power. Some enemies were attuned to certain forms, which required players to stick with a particular playstyle to counter them. He also possesses a special whip, allowing him to pull himself to enemies or yank them towards him, and to reach platforms that are a distance away from him. DMC places a larger emphasis on environmental storytelling, focusing heavily on the fluctuating environments that embody the larger themes of the game. Dante would get pulled into the demonic parallel reality known as Limbo, showing off the distortion of the human world while within the alternate realm. In one mission, a popular nightclub in the human world becomes a winding nightmare gallery of neon lights and pulsating rhythmic beats in Limbo, with the ambient club noises and songs reverberating throughout to create physical platforms throughout the levels. With music from both industrial metal band Combi Christ and neuro-funk group Noisia, DMC's soundtrack is an eclectic blend of heavy, harsh beats with the slick sounds of electronica infused into the battles and key moments of the story. Ninja Theory also included a rather clever take on dynamic music, 
with the player's actual performance in combat actively amplifying the intensity of the battle tracks. If you managed to hit an S rank in battle, the vocals from the song would kick in. Shortly after its launch, Capcom released the returning Bloody Palace mode along with the DLC epilogue, Virgil's Downfall. In this expansion, players take on the role of Virgil shortly after his defeats at the hands of Dante. Set entirely in the demon world, the ending of the mini-campaign shows Virgil's embracing his inner darkness, which teased what was to come in a potential sequel. Though still a polarizing game, DMC Devil May Cry received mostly favorable reviews. However, there were numerous criticisms for the 360 and PS3's technical issues, such as the inconsistent frame rate, which were ultimately remedied for the PC release. In GameSpot's review, DMC's style and approach to combat was well-liked, although the technical shortcomings were too common to overlook. DMC Devil May Cry didn't quite meet Capcom's lofty goals. However, it still proved to be a solid seller for all platforms, particularly the PC release, which saw numerous player mods. Soy tu cita para el baile, saco de mierda. In the years since, Itsuno has praised DMC Devil May Cry, even stating in an interview with Game Informer that it's his favorite. Despite receiving flack from fans, the developers at Ninja Theory enjoyed their time with the series, stating that DMC was their finest work up until that point. Since the reboot's release, Capcom had kept quiet on the series. However, that silence broke in 2014 with the simultaneous announcements of DMC Definitive Edition and Devil May Cry 4 Special Edition. Ninja Theory's return for the Definitive Edition yielded improvements to the existing game's mechanics. In addition to adding in the new Hardcore mode, which rebalanced the game and altered certain design quirks, it also greatly improved performance that maintained a solid 60 frames per second. This release, while not fixing every issue that fans had, did go on to receive a stronger reception from both them and critics alike. In Devil May Cry 4 Special Edition, Capcom and co-developer Access Games added three new playable characters to the game. Along with the firearm-focused Lady and the Sparta sword-wielding Trish, the returning antagonist Virgil also made a comeback. Although Nero and Dante's campaign was intact, Lady and Trish could also replace both characters for their own story, and Virgil himself could experience the entire campaign solo. Dante would make yet another appearance in the popular crossover fighting game Marvel vs. Capcom as a playable character in Infinite. Dante was the lone character from the series who made an appearance. However, he still brought plenty of weapons and his particular brand of style that made him stand out in the roster. The status of the series remained unknown after the release of both Enhanced Editions in 2015. Still, that didn't stop fans from sharing their passion for the series online with many combo exhibition videos. The continued pace of these videos would further energize the DMC community, getting fans to organize their own events online, some of which were for charity. Eventually, rumors began to spread online of a new DMC game in development, dealing the return that many had been hoping for. Hey, honey. Need assistance? Hey, you have to hit every single bump in the road? <laughs> and I'm my crew! Revealed at E3 2018, Devil May Cry 5 is bringing back familiar faces such as Dante, Nero, Lady, and Trish. Featuring a campaign with three playable characters, including the newcomer V, DMC 5 channels much of the series' classic gameplay, while also adding more modern flair that gives it a look unlike any other in the series. Set after Devil May Cry 4, the next game will also mark the end of the Sons of Sparta storyline involving Dante, Nero, and the possibility of the reappearance of Virgil. With fans having expressed a desire for the series to make a return, DMC5 director Hideaki Itsuno took to the stage during Microsoft's E3 press conference and proudly stated, DMC is back! <laughs> Set for launch on March 8th, 2019, DMC5 will be the return that fans of the series have been waiting 11 years for. Devil May Cry.
The Devil May Cry series has made an undeniable impact on the action genre, pressing its players to learn its mechanics and be better, while also pushing Capcom itself to adapt to new challenges on their own front. The franchise will also see another adaption in a new Netflix animated series from Adi Shankar, the producer behind the current Castlevania series. So we haven't heard the end of DMC for quite some time. As the street fighter of the action genre, the series' brand of stylish action is iconic as it is endearing. Capcom and other developers like Platinum Games and Sony Santa Monica with their recent God of War reboot still carry the torch for pure action games, proving that the spirit of Devil May Cry is still alive and well. Thank you for watching this episode of History Of, and special thank you to Alessandro Filari who wrote this episode.